going to um, introduce Sarah while they're all, those of us who are gathering, um, to um, let you know that um, Sharon Terry uh, is president and chief scientific officer of, um, Sarah. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, uh, programs changed. Okay. Okay, very good. Sarah, my apologies. You're an astrophysicist. You're not a biologist, which makes it even better. An astrophysicist and planetary scientist at MIT. Um, you work on theory, computation, and data analysis of exoplanets, and we do have a physicist in the audience who is very interested in in astronomy. Um, <clears throat> Sarah's research covers exoplanet characterization, detection of an exoplanet atmosphere, and um, is a co-PI co on um, the MIT test NASA exploration mission that's going out in 2017. So this is pretty impressive. And the Subject matter is do awards matter. I think we've gathered all here. It's been a very enthusiastic two days, um, Sarah. So um, you've got some uh, very enthusiastic listeners in the audience. So let's, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Yes. 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 Well, thanks for taking my participation remotely. I have an assigned talk. I'm not sure exactly who came up with the idea. But what I, I'm going to do is switch over to PowerPoint for about 15 minutes, and then we can all come back together for a discussion. And Ashley has graciously volunteered to move through the slides. Now, you'll hear me through Skype, and I can still see some of you in the front row. And feel free to ask questions as we go along. I hope you do. And what's really cool, I can see myself on your screen. <laughs> I can see a delay, so I can kind of see how it, you know, how the delay works for you. Okay, Ashley, I'm ready for you to switch over to my PowerPoint slides. Okay, great. Here's my title slide. I always love this slide because it's a real photograph of our sky, our dark sky. And in this photograph, um, it's not what our eyes could see because you need a long exposure. But in a long exposure, you just see so many stars, they just fill the sky. And for a lot of us who work in astronomy and astrophysics, this is what captured our imagination to start with. Next slide. So what I decided to do was divide my 15 minutes of talking into four parts. I want to give you a brief background of who I am and my research, and I'll tell you some of the um, stories about getting awarded the MacArthur Fellow this year because it's very relevant to the topic. I just had a couple of things about um, the lack of women getting awards in the fields that I work in. It's actually pretty shocking. I already knew about it, and we all have examples from our own fields, but it's worth reviewing. And then do words matter? I think I left the question mark off because <laughs> I really, I think we all have an answer and you'll see what mine is when I get there. Okay, next slide. Oh, right, you know what? Can you go to the next slide? I think I put these out of order. Right, okay, let's talk about this first. Here's sort of a summary of what I work on. I work in a field called exoplanets. Exoplanets are planets that orbit stars other than the sun. You know, our own sun has eight planets, depending on how you count them. And so we would naturally expect that other stars, which all the stars in our sky are also suns, we'd expect them to have planets also, and they do. And it's only been really in the last 20 years that astronomers have been able to find and characterize exoplanets. And they have found, statistically speaking, that every star in our Milky Way galaxy should have at least one planet. And more than that, recently announced from NASA's Kepler Space Telescope was that approximately, very, very, very approximately, one in five stars like the sun could have a planet like Earth. There's like a lot of caveats there, so I'm giving you the kind of big picture. But what's so amazing about these planetary systems is that none of them are like our solar system. Our solar system has our terrestrial planets very close to our sun and giant planet Jupiter quite far from the sun. But it's been, uh, it's actually a good thing that our solar system isn't common or we wouldn't be where we are today in the search for other planets because our solar system is very hard to find. Nonetheless, something like, um, if we think about sun-like stars, it's gotta be one in 10 or less would be like our solar system. We can't find them easily, but they're all sorts of 
types of planetary systems out there. There are systems which would have five or six planets all orbiting uh, what would be interior to our own Mercury's orbit. We have found planets so close to the star, they're orbiting very quickly, their year is equivalent to less than one of Earth's days. And these planets we think are heated so much by the star that they have, for the rocky ones, lava on the surface, liquid rock, because the planet is heated so much by its star. We found planets that we hope uh, are like none we've seen before. Actually, wait, let me, um, anyway, they're just hugely numbers of crazy, I could just talk about it forever. I wish I was there so I could tell you more. But I'll just let you know my favorite discovery in exoplanets, maybe so far at all. And uh, that is actually the most common type of planet in our galaxy. If you stop and pause and think about this for a second, I don't know about you, but I always thought it would be something like Jupiter. Jupiter is a big, massive planet. The theories of planet formation tell us that when one planet grows and starts getting big, it exhausts everything around it. It's sort of like a vacuum cleaner sucks in all the material from its feeding zone and just grows to be big. Um, but you know what the most common type of planet is? It's not a Jupiter-sized planet. It's a planet two to three times the size of Earth, a small planet for which we have no solar system counterpart and we don't even have an understanding of how those planets have formed. I mean, the most common type of planet might be even smaller, rocky planets like Earth, but we don't have enough data yet to say that for sure. So just sort of the field of exoplanets, it's growing, it's still snowballing, lots of exciting results are happening. Um, and I just wanted to summarize to you that where we're trying to head is to find planets like Earth. We want to be able to look at their atmospheres and find uh, signs of life in the atmosphere. Next slide. Can you go back one, actually? And I just wanted to share with you my most recent trip to Washington. Actually, this was one of the most exciting days of my, I was going to say my year, but it might have been my entire life, actually. And the um, United States House of Representatives Committee on Space Science and Technology invited me and two other people. The other two people are NASA employees to talk about what is, they wanted like a written and a written, a formal written and spoken statement about what is the status of the search for life beyond Earth. This was like the first time that Congress had wanted to know like what is really happening, what can we actually do about it. So if you're interested in this, please go and read my statement. I actually, I spent like five days over Thanksgiving writing it. So that's the part that will live on. They'll look back at it. People do like when other of my colleagues have talked to them and you know, they use it in future years to see what do we need? What could we do? How much does it cost? What kind of mission space telescope would be required? So we covered all that ground. We got a bit of flack, actually. Unfortunately, you would think this was the most um, bipartisan issue imaginable, but they got a lot of flack because the Democrats said, well, you guys are wasting time. Why are you talking about alien life when we have better stuff to do? But the argument beyond astrobiology and beyond exoplanets and life was, you know, there's a lot going on here. We're trying to encourage STEM education in our nation. And exoplanets has reached the country like almost nothing else has or can today. You would not believe the number of people of all ages and all walks of life who not only are interested in exoplanets, but who want to actually work on it, either through undergraduate education, retired engineers, just random people who want to do so-called citizen science, you know, via the internet. So we have this huge thing. And we also tried to make the point clear that, you know, actually when we were giving that, I know I'm going off on a bit of a side here, but I'll let you know how it's related in a minute. When we were there, that very day, China was on its way to the moon. You know what, and one of my remarks was, you know, we, we all, in academia at least, those of us who work with, interact with the Chinese, they can copy exquisitely, but they don't innovate. You know, that may change. And when we try to build complicated space telescopes in the civilian world, we actually uh, push ourselves to innovate. And that staying at the leading edge of technology is very critical for us as a nation. So anyway, I was just letting you know, it wasn't just about life. You can go and look back and listen to it and stuff. But one of the reasons I was chosen this is, <laughs> so, I had been invited to give this just after I'd become a MacArthur Fellow, just after I got the uh, announcement, just after the announcement came out. And I didn't like question whether or not I should have been chosen, because actually I think I would have been asked anyway. They actually asked around people they knew, and they got a bunch of suggestions and then chose from that pool. But it certainly helped that I had just been awarded a MacArthur Fellow. I mean, there's no question that it put me um, on the map for these people who didn't know who I was. I'm all of a sudden kind of blessed from the outside. And that's partly why I wanted to give you this example, partly to show you where exoplanets is today and how seriously the world is taking the search for planets like Earth and for life beyond Earth. And uh, also it's tied into the MacArthur Fellow because you know we can't go back and do the experiment again, but it really got people's attention. And that's part of the theme of Do Awards Matter? Next slide. 
Okay, yeah, the next one after that. Um, right, so here's the little thing about the MacArthur. You can go there and look at my video bio, and I'll just mention a couple things that are just for fun. One is, because um, people love hearing the story, it's very, the whole process is extremely anonymous. You don't know anything until you get the call. But because um, I have a great assistant, I know some of you interact with him, Derek. And I didn't get a call because he didn't let the call through. <laughs> what happens is I do tend to, because of my work, I get a lot of calls and occasionally we'll get one from someone who wants to know about UFOs, like they thought they've seen a UFO or an alien, and I don't take those calls. We actually pass them on to someone at the SETI Institute who actually does deal with those. But this call, just anything that sounds weird, we just don't do. So it just sounded weird. They're like, it was so secretive and so strange. So then I got this email from the MacArthur Foundation saying, your very professional and protective assistant, Derek, did not let us through. But at first, when I read it, you know how when you read your email, you just see like the header, you don't know who it's from, or you just see the first line of the message? And I just thought, oh boy, I'm going to actually have to talk to one of these UFO types. <laughs> so well, ultimately, they got in touch with me the next day. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention before I get on to how the award has made a difference in my life was, if you, you can look at my video bio and you'll see at the very end, they ask, what are you going to do? Well, they take hours and hours of tape when they just put a three minute bio. And the comment that I actually got the most about wasn't about my work, is at the very end, they're like, what are you going to do with the money? And since this is the Art Rosalind Franklin Society, um, I mean, I know she didn't have kids and stuff, but I just said I'm using all of it on the home front so I can keep my brain free to feel creative and I don't have to clog it with like, this sounds a little extravagant, but I don't have to clog it with like, I still kind of do, but I don't have to clog it with like laundry or making dinner or whatever. I'm just going to spend it all. And I'm a single mother, so I put that in there. And people wrote to me from all over the place and they're like, oh my God, are you allowed to say that in public? <laughs> and they really were so thrilled that even men would comment on it, that it was puzzling that you were even allowed to just say this. And they were shocked that I would take the, it's 625,000 over some number of years. I mean, I will try to save some of it, don't get me wrong. But the cost of, uh, this is another topic, is just unbelievable. So in some, I'll just say the awards with cash are, in, are amazingly helpful. And this is a huge cash award, but even before, I got another award for like an order of magnitude less. It just came at the right time. Um, you know, whether you want to save or spend is different. I've always believed in spending to get what I need so I can get my job done because it's unbelievable. Otherwise, you're really doing two jobs. I didn't know this before, but recently I had to unfortunately figure it all out. Okay, so those are the two kind of cute stories about the award. Um, and now, um, let's see. I'm just trying to let you know how this award has helped and then we'll go on to the more generics. So it actually, what I learned from the award, and this is a really important thing I didn't really know before. I think a lot of you might have already known it, but people don't trust their own judgment. They like to have an outside you know, blessing. And we see this in academia, like you won't get, um, you won't get like a huge promotion or extra resources unless another university is trying to steal you away. Because the infrastructure or like the people who are running your university, they don't have a good metric. I mean, you can publish a lot of papers, you can put them in high impact journals, but people have trouble really evaluating us. And so these awards end up being, um, especially these very prestigious ones, I just was shocked actually by uh, the way, I won't say people treated me very differently because I was already well known in my field, um, but it was surprising. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one is I recently took up a leadership role in a concept study for a very complicated space telescope. It's a NASA study and they gave us constraints like budget and year for launch. It's all part of a complicated political thing that's going on, but nonetheless, I can lead this. Um, and the people weren't totally sure about me being their leader because I hadn't worked with these folks for like 10 years. And 10 years ago, I was like a junior faculty or senior postdoc or something. Um, and then they were, once I started working with them, they were fine with it. They saw clearly I had you know, grown up, so to speak. But once I got the award, you know, something changed. It was like the outside blessing. Even though they knew for themselves I was the right person for that job, the outside thing helped. One more example was I was uh, contacted out of the blue by someone who works at um, a, a subset of Northrop Grumman. It's some um, very, all they do is think of crazy things and build them. And they needed like the kind of civilian uh, space test. So they came to me for one of my projects and they said this thing, I can't tell you what it is right now, but we just signed NDAs and it was very secretive. This thing, we think it would work with yours. We need to kind of do something. And I showed up and uh, I was with my, one of my students, Mary Knapp, a super duper sophist. I mean, she's like, she acts like a professor and she's a grad student. So the two of us show up 
and you could tell they had no idea what to do with us because they're not used to two, you know, she looks, I mean, they're not used to just two women showing up. Like they just could, they didn't know what box to put us in. But, you know, after we start talking and working with them, clearly they're okay with us. You know, we can fit their mold. We're not there, we can't fit their mold, but they're okay with us. And then later on, they visited us at MIT just after I got the MacArthur. And the, <laughs> the guy was, our main contact was thrilled. He was just so happy. He's like, I feel like he got the outside blessing. He was proud of me, even though I didn't really know him. And he's like, yeah, everyone called and said, is that the same Sarah? And you could see that just having that validation from the outside was so critical. So the award was useful because it's like people can't trust their own judgment. They need an outside uh, rubber stamp to say this person is uh, worth my time or this person is whatever. That was one thing. And the second thing I want to mention about the award, which comes back for later, was it's the reason I'm going to say at the end why awards matter. There's like, um, it's like an accumulation of things. So I did the congressional hearing, which may or may not have been tied to the MacArthur, but it certainly helped. And then I, I've had a huge number of follow-up things from that. So I can pick and choose from the things I want to do. But it's not just because I did one thing than the other, right? I mean, I did the best job I could at the congressional hearing. And so it will lead to other things. But the award gives you um, exposure in a way that you'll never get any other way. And that can lead to many, many more things. And so it's a sort of ongoing um, accumulation of, of accumulation of successes. And that if you're not getting the awards, you're not getting that. Okay, next slide. So um, I hope that I, I always, you know, sort of as you get older, you always hope you appear young. Well, I thought I was too um, young to see these kind of biases in my own people. <laughs> but when I was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in the year, I think like roughly around 2000, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, they have two different types of jobs they give young people. One's the three-year postdoc, one's the five-year postdoc. Well, you know, like in that 30 or I don't know, 50 year history, there had never been a five-year female physics postdoc ever, except for me. When I got this Helen B. Warner Prize, um, I got it when, whenever, that's like an early career thing for theoretical physics. In its 60 year history, there's only two women who've gotten it, me and the other person who got it, not to discredit her because she's brilliant, uh, got it with her husband. They got it at the same time. Like, how can this be possible? There's so many women working in theory and astrophysics. Why aren't I even getting these awards? Then the gold medal of, I don't have the gold medal, but I, that, I just chose two examples. I found many, many, many of them. This gold medal in the Royal, that's like the United Kingdom, Royal Astronomical Society, like three women have gotten it in like 200 years. <laughs> so you sort of look through these things and you start wondering, there's just such a huge lack. And you know, it's the whole topic that the theme of the accumulation and the visibility and it's just not happening. Okay, next slide. So when I was preparing for this, I came across this article. I just encourage you to read it the article, and what they did was they specifically analyzed Nobel Prizes in physics for women. And um, I'll just give you a minute to work through these, and this is like, we can come back to this in the discussion if we have time, but out of all the things I looked at, I thought this was the most useful, because they took some real data and tried to answer these questions um, specifically. So I'm going to give you like maybe 30 seconds to look it over, and we can go through their points. You have the link, and you can go and look at the the answers later. So it's a kind of a short article, but they kind of go through. I thought these were really interesting points, and they go through them. And um, I'm just going to try to give you a verbal summary of what they ended up saying. But I'd be interested. I think it's a discussion point because we can all say what we think um, about it. So for the first point, there are not enough women earning PhDs. You know, they look at the data and they do some number crunching, and they say. That's not the problem. There are plenty of PhDs. Um, number two, um, well, we can't really know exactly what women are researching, but they claim that you know there are definitely enough women um, who are working on the basic research that should, you know, given that you have a choice of what you're working on, lead there eventually. They actually think the third one may have some role and equal access to career building opportunities. We're not just limited to awards here, but I hope I've given you some anecdotal experience of how it helps for career building. And they mentioned um, 
a few other things. For number four, the pool of nominees. Uh, yeah, this is interesting. The pool of nominees includes too few women. But did you know the Nobel is quite secretive, actually, and they don't reveal, they have like a 50-year lockdown on anything. So we don't know if women have been included, uh, if there are enough women in the nominees. I'll come back to that in a second. Number five um, is uh, a bias thing. And I think they actually, in the article, they because sort of uh, process of elimination, they do kind of go with that, that bias thing. I don't know if that's true or not. But I thought these questions were relevant and provocative. Um, so for the Nobel thing, it's really um, private and nobody knows how it actually works. But I have just heard that recently they do ask, you know, for is anyone overlooked? Are there any women overlooked? So we'll see what happens. Um, that's the bit of the thing. Okay, so let's go back to my last slide now. Do words matter? It's my personal opinion from my own experience and from what I see all around me that yes, they really do matter. I'm not saying that getting an award, whether it's the early career or one later, will make or break your career. It won't. But it opens up the opportunity uh, that you wouldn't necessarily get otherwise. And it's this whole thing that we constantly see for women in physics and women in science is that accumulated advantages lead to disparities. And these can have major consequences in uh, so many areas. Well, that concludes my prepared remarks. And um, now, if you can put me back on the screen, I'd be curious to hear your questions or opinions on any of these issues. So thanks for your attention. Uh, would, are there any questions from the audience? Let me ask one question of you. Um, uh, do you see, uh, since you're now at MIT, do you see an increase in the number of women coming in as graduate students or even as undergraduate students in physics and or astronomy, or is that still on that um, kind of a yes, level? Well, about MIT, there's plenty of women in undergraduate and graduate physics. So if you wanted to sort of go over what the problems are, I don't think the problem is the numbers that are coming in. Um, they still have a problem with the numbers of women faculty in physics. But in general, for the students, it seems like there's plenty of women. All right. I had the opportunity some years ago, and I think things, I hope things have changed, to be on an accreditation team uh, at MIT. And um, that, was, that was way, way back when Walter Rosenblith was still. Um, yeah, things have changed quite a great deal. And in fact, our recent uh, department head, Ed Birchinger, he was big on making it like a comfortable place for women and minorities. And he really tried to push some issues forward. Um, I think we still suffer from a pretty serious problem with women. This is now going off on a tangent, but it's related. I think one of the reasons women aren't getting awards is some of them are not, they're not doing cut, the most cutting edge, cutting edge research they could. And this relates to some other things. Um, we can get into them or not, but it's well, that thing about fear and lack of confidence and things like that. And those appear to be some of the major reasons that women are failing and are not going as far as they could. Well, I was appalled when I, I, sh I guess appalled, and I was just surprised when I asked one of the graduate students who was doing extremely well, very, very bright, what she planned to do, and she said, well, she would go get a job designing toys, and I thought, what? And her uh, reaction was that she didn't think she was good enough to do any better, and I, I right, found well, that's that. that's what I mean. I mean, we see that as a pervasive problem at all levels. Perhaps, you know, from what you say, just to even something else. Any questions from any of the others? Yes, Florence. Florence Hazeltine would like to ask a question. She's coming to the microphone. <laughs> Technical challenge. Oh, come on up forward. Oh, here, even better. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm Florence Hazeltine. Um, very nice to meet you, and congratulations. Um, I, the question that I have is, number one, I want to know if I can call you up and get a yeah. statement from you, because we have a project called the RAISE Project. You can view it online, raiseproject.org, at which we try to 
list how many men and how many women have received awards and we have of accolades. We have about 50,000 cited examples. And I'm unfortunately <laughs> realize that a lot of the people in this room I don't have in the system enough, so. Um, but um, one of the things is, is that we're trying to go through some of the things that people need to um, do if they're gonna promote, them, promote themselves. One is they often help, have to write the thing, although I know you couldn't do it for the MacArthur. Um, but also uh, things that people need to think about and how important it is. And you're stating that this award is important is exactly the type of thing that we think is valuable and we'd like to you expand on it. I can actually respond to that first. I forgot to say I wish that awards weren't important. I wish, you know, I mean, for people like me who work in the field, my gratification comes from solving a hard problem, from actually getting to spend time on research and not on all the other tedious things I have to do. And so I really do wish we didn't live in a world where awards were necessary. So I hate to have to kind of play the game, so to speak. But I think the best thing we can do right now if we want to see a more level playing field is uh, okay, I'll just tell you the story. Do you know Vera Rubin? Do you guys know Vera Rubin? Very, very well. Everybody knows Vera. Well, unfor uh, yeah, unfortunately, Vera is now suffering from Alzheimer's. When I um, worked with Vera, I was actually kind of got her old job. When she retired, I worked at the Carnegie Institution of Washington. That's where it was my first real job. And she would spend so much time writing nominations for like every possible woman, for every award. She would make sure to nominate women. And so you, know, you can't nom you wouldn't want to, nor should you be nominating yourself for most of these awards. But you know the fact that she put so much effort into that, huge amounts of effort. I think that was something we need to tell each other because we're all so busy. I don't know about you, but I'm writing like millions of letters. Whatever your job is, you're just so overwhelmed. Why would you do something voluntary? I mean, you don't have time to do one other thing. But Vera always did that, and she made a big deal. So I think one thing is getting those. Um, those uh, things out there. The other thing, which is related to the awards and the whole success of women in science, is this real problem of the lack of confidence. We had that example of pillow making, but there's examples at other levels, like lack of confidence to take risks, you know, lack of confidence to try something maybe you want to do but don't really have the confidence. So I think really, if it wasn't just about awards, I would put my finger on those two specific things. I remember <clears throat> being on a panel with Vera Rubin describing, much as we've just asked you to do, uh, you know, your, your experiences and so forth. And Vera said that um, when she was home uh, raising the children, because she wasn't allowed to work, and she wasn't allowed to use the telescope, um, and she ended up doing her PhD at Georgetown University in a very limited telescope, but she said that when the astronomy journals would come to the house, she would cry because she wanted so badly to uh, be in the lab. Well, things have changed since then, fortunately, but you know, Vera would always complain when I was with her that things hadn't changed enough. Like, women were allowed to do things now, but they still weren't there in the numbers necessary. One more question coming up. So I have two questions for you, uh, unrelated, really. The first one is, do you know who nominated you for the MacArthur Fellow? Um, not, not, I'm not looking for a name. I just wondered if you ever found out. Okay, well, in the end, I kind of did. This is totally offline. The person actually told me. <laughs> didn't hear that, okay? Just because you asked, it's like a private. Yes, meeting. because they're not supposed to let you know um, <laughs> that they are even a nominator. He told me. He told me like after, you know, like not before, much later. Yeah. So, so was this someone who had nominated you for other things? Do you know? Uh, that I don't know for sure. Yeah. So the the other question I had, you you said you did a five year postdoc and then you won a junior faculty award. Do you think the, these all built to help? steer your career? Do you think that doing the five-year postdoc gave you more confidence or something? Do you think yeah, right. winning this so junior didn't award? I didn't do the five-year postdoc. It was a five-year position, which was prestigious. Okay. But in the end, I didn't do that because I got the offer from Carnegie, the Vera Rubin place. And so I couldn't, you know, they pressured, I had to, I couldn't wait two years before I took it. So um, the postdoc thing is a real problem. I mean, it's such a problem having that uncertainty hanging over your head of where to go. So personally, I didn't do the postdoc. I think for most people, they just don't have a choice of what to do. But I think everybody needs as much time as possible to do research and not be bogged down by the duties of running a university. Okay, so the, the question I was really trying to get at was, um, do you think that um, your, the junior award helped you gain confidence or helped you in some other ways to get the MacArthur Fellow? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, let me think. 
Okay, I don't, but I actually think that the confidence building thing is 100.0% absolutely essential. And in my particular case, um, my confidence building happened while I was a child. Okay, I was like, yeah, people won't believe me when I tell them this, but I was definitely like the wimpiest kid like that was ever born. And so I sort of, the confidence was, it was kind of, I mean, it's really relevant. I hope if I can ever talk to you again, I can explain this sort of theory to you, but it was my dad who made me stronger. And so I've had a, a theory and experiment, and I've taken a bunch of women students and postdocs, and I've helped them, like, reach a level of confidence that's required. So in my case, um, I'm not sure. I think the junior award, I think it was really helpful in building, I guess the answer to your question is sort of yes, it was definitely helpful. But it was less the award itself, and it was the confidence of um, when I got the five-year position, it was my mentor, John Bacall. It was really him. It wasn't that like I got this five-year thing. I'm like, I have no idea why you gave this to me. I didn't think I was worthy of that position. And so it wasn't actually just getting that and going, oh, I'm so great. It was like, I just have no idea why this happened. And he actually went through why. He actually said it's because A, B, C, D, E. And so it did give me confidence, but not in the way you thought. It was because there was a person who believed in me who uh, was able to help me see why I was good at what I did. Did that help? Yes, it does. But don't draw any conclusions from it, but let me say the awards are made for creativity, uniqueness, and for um, really being outside of the mundane and the ordinary. So it's for terrific achievement. So understand that that's why you got it. Awesome. But don't draw any conclusions. <laughs> uh, yes, promise is another, well, it depends because they give them at all ages. Uh, I'm, t I'm telling you all more than I should know. <laughs> Hi, Sarah, I'm Madeline Jacobs. I'm the executive director of the American Chemical Society. Thank you very much for sharing this and also congratulations. I just wanted to share a, a, a little survey that we did, uh, actually that I did about um, the impact of awards on women chemists. So um, I was asked to speak at a symposium on the 80th anniversary of the ACS awards. And so I looked at all of the women who had won awards over the course of about 20 years from ACS. We give 65 national awards, but uh, we don't have a huge number of women. So I was able to contact every living person um, who, over the course of about 15 years, who had won an award. I excluded the Garvin Medal winners because that's only given to women, and I excluded the High School Chemistry Teacher Award because that's usually given to women. So these were technical fields. And I asked them only three questions, and I thought I might get a 20% response. And the letter went out to about 100 people, and I received 77 responses. And I only, I only wanted them to answer three questions about, you know, what impact did this have on your career, and what advice do you have? When, when did you get this award in terms of your career? What impact did it have? And what advice would you give to other women who feel that they haven't gotten awards? And I'll be happy to share this talk with, with anybody. But just real quickly, the bottom line was it very much, first of all, they all loved getting the award. And, and the first question was, what impact did the ACS award have? And the best answer was the woman who said, I used the cash prize to have LASIK surgery. Um, and so now I didn't have to wear glasses and I could actually see the soap in the shower. So that was the best answer. <laughs> but um, the, the, the two, two takeaways were it depended on where they were in their career, what impact the award had. And if they were at the early part of their career, the visibility that it gave them really made a difference in helping them get invited to speak at major conferences, to get that exposure, to right. be... Right, and to be seen seriously. So I was just reinforcing that that was very, very true to women who were in the early part of their career. Mid-career, it had a very different impact because these were women who either already had been successful in industry or had become tenured. But it had a different kind of thing in, this, in the sense that they were then also, again, it was a visibility thing where they got called on to do even more important things in the government, serve as heads of panels. Women who uh, unfortunately were recognized late in their career had it had no impact at all. In some and in some cases, they were annoyed that the American Chemical Society had taken so long to you know to reward them to 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 notice them. They had been already elected to the National Academy of Science or Engineering, and so it, it had nothing to do with with them. So that was that was one thing about impact. The other was um, they all gave me advice, and so I put that together as a top ten list of things that women can do. 
And uh, I'm not going to do that here because we'll we're, we're be out of time. But I will share this with the with the Rosalind Franklin Society, and can sure, I'd love to see and I'll, I'll I'll send it I'll send it to you. It, it really was very interesting, and it's it it goes to some of the things you said about you know you've got to like Vera, you've got to find someone to write those nominations. You've got to toot your own horn. A lot of women don't want to do that. I always tell women if you don't toot it, who will? So anyway, but congratulations. Very good. I must say that it depends if there's a cash award. When I got the Stockholm Water Prize, it allowed me to bring my grandchildren to meet the King and Queen of Sweden. So that was worth it. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, thank, thank you for your time and making the effort. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I'll see you. Bye, Sarah. Right. Bye. <laughs>